He lives. Welcome, CJ Graham. This is a costume. Please tell me it's a costume. You don't wear this around. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. You got your machete with you? Look at it. Socks are different. Shoes are different. Got two different colored you know what's. I'm being polite because there's yes. no people in here. Right? Yeah. All right, brother. God bless you. Welcome him again. Hi. Yeah. Right. How are you? Good. Got quiet, didn't I? <laughs> All right, so let me clarify a couple things, just because, you know, I'm just that kind of guy. You. You're talking to the Beatles, and you're wearing a Rolling Stones t-shirt. He's got a Stand Halloween up. shirt on. Stand up and show everybody what you're wearing. <laughs> so for those of you that came by my table, real men, use a machete, not an Outback steak knife. <laughs> Right? I like Castle. I like all the guys. Ty Tyler. Hey, they're all good, but Outback Steak Knife. <laughs> Who needs a microphone, right? <laughs> so when you when you come on board, man, as Jason, we're very well aware of who he is and what he is capable of. My first question not to get, what are you a a born horror fan, were you a fan of the franchise when you came on board to be Jason? No. If, uh, to give you an example, I was a big horror fan, like Lon Chaney, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., Frankenstein, Werewolf, Mummy, Dracula, for those of you that are old enough to remember that. Uh, I was a fan of that, but when I got an opportunity to play the Jason part, um, just for the record, you may recall, I was the second choice. Some of you don't know that. So there's a scene in there that's not me. And you probably don't know that either, but I'm very honest about it. The scene where the paintball, you see the paintballs hitting the chest area. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it's a little bigger than I am, even today. And most people just assume I'm wearing padding. It's not me. Because originally the cast went to another gentleman uh, who was a stunt man, stunt coordinator. And that was the first daily that came back Unfortunately, when the Daily came back, uh, the presence wasn't what Paramount Studios was looking for, and they called me back in to interview on a Friday. By Tuesday, I was back on set reshooting. That's the only scene that we didn't reshoot because it was done in the daytime. So I actually had to go take a look at the film to know what I was doing when I was asked to come do the part. So for those of you who have heard somebody say, you know, um, the rest is history, the rest is history because I wasn't in Los Angeles to be an actor or a stuntman. Uh, for the record, I'd never done a stunt in my life until you saw me on screen being set on fire, going through doors, going through walls, etc. So a lot of people, in fact, I did a uh, panel with uh, Tom Morga and Ken Hot uh, Kane Hodder about six months ago. And when Kane found out I'd never done a stunt in my life, he had no idea that I wasn't a stuntman. He just looked at me and was, you know, a little shocked. But when you're 27, 28, you can do anything, right? <laughs> Set me on fire. But history being as it is, here we are talking about it 30 some odd years later. So it's a pleasure to be here. Right on. Had you, when they offer you the role, then did you go back and watch them prior to arriving on set so you kind of had an idea of to prepare what they were gonna ask of you? Yeah, what I did was when I got the initial call to come to Paramount Studios to meet Frank Mancuso, Frank Mancuso Jr., uh, Tom McLaughlin, the writer-director, and uh, Michael Nomad, the stunt coordinator, I did go back and take a look at number four, number three, which was uh, Ted White, and of course Richard, who's passed on, to get an idea to gauge what the character referenced. So when I went in there, I kind of knew what they were looking for in general. But the interesting part is once I got it, Tom McLaughlin sat me down and really just gave me more details of what he was looking for. And it just happened he was an old uh, horror fan like I was of the Frankensteins and stuff. So he wanted kind of like the first zombie, but he didn't want him to be robotic, curiosity, show emotion through power. So it was kind of a nice, you know, sometimes all the stars line up and it worked out well. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's funny that you say that he was a fan of the classic horror movies because right off the get, you get one of the coolest Friday, if not the coolest Friday opening sequence with, you know, Tommy dig- digging you up and the whole pike through the chest and the Frankenstein-esque lightning catches and all of a sudden you're back in the game. I mean, that is a really rad scene. Yeah, I got, I, I'm really fortunate. Um, part six is in the middle of the series, as everyone knows. But I always tell people that I talk to that ask me about it is, you know, I get to be the only Jason that has a James Bond opening. It's kind of cool, yeah. right? Yeah. I get to be the only Jason that came back to life like Frankenstein. Kind of cool. I'm the only Jason that was fortunate enough to have a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Alice Cooper, do the yeah. music. Kind of cool. I'm also the only Jason that has a Batman utility belt. Yeah. You ever thought about it? And for those of you who can remember the Abbott and Costello, there's a little bit of comedy in it. You know, never leave home without it was a big saying back in the 80s with the credit card, the American Express. They always said, never leave home without it. And so there was a little bit of, and that was all Tom. Tom McLaughlin, when he wrote this, he had that in mind. And that's how he created Jason to, I, I think, take it to another level uh, as we sit here and talk about it today. I mean, your Jason is just like that brute force type of Jason too. Like you, the, the um, speed in which you walk and you stalk and your the triple head decapitation, like it's like a, a brutality that he, because he evolves all the way from um, the little boy Jason, obviously, but when you see him, you know, Steve Dash and Sackhead, to to you and then from you again to you know freddy versus jason like there is an evolution there and it's almost like you're turning that page in number six and becoming just this brute force yeah i think when you look at part six you know another reference point is there's no nudity there's a couple full little words very simple but if you look at some of the series you'll see not just brief nudity but nudity and Tom didn't get into that. It was really about Jason. And I think part six, you know, if you look at the first part of the series, Jason wasn't really the principal. They call them principals. Those are your actors. Jason was a character in the Friday the 13th series. But when part six finally evolved, Jason became the principal. The movie was about the hockey mask. The iconic hockey mask became the series as we went forward. So again, I'm really fortunate to be right in the middle of the series. Yeah, the... uh the relationship between Jason and Tommy Jarvis um, is right up there in like the horror rivalries. Like he is, you know, Jamie Lee to Michael, and then uh, Nancy to Freddie type of a thing. Like you're the one who uh, you don't have a final girl; you have a final guy. Like he keeps coming back for you. Yeah, I'm still. I still have difficulties with Megadhead. You know, being offended like that, I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a mean thing to say to somebody, calling me maggot head. So to this day, I still have uh, retaliation towards him. So occasionally when I do a show, and I understand he did this show uh, a while back, ago, yeah. uh, if I catch up with him, you know, him and I are going to have it out one more time. <laughs> All right. What was one of your, uh, your favorite kills to do with the practical effects that you guys got to do? Well, I think that's interesting because you were talking about the brute force. To me, personally, I think if you think about it, you know, blood and guts, anybody can do blood and guts. And that's nice, but, you know, heads popping off, hearts coming out, it's kind of natural, right? In my mind it is. <laughs> but brute force is when you take a sheriff and you break their back. But you don't see, you hear it. And that's a little more scary because there's a reality factor. You know, for those of you that know my little brother, Kane Hodder, anybody know Kane? <laughs> my brother will tell you his, his favorite kill is a sleep bag. You don't see the blood and guts, but you hear it. Yeah. So if you can envision the power and the brute that it would take to break somebody's back or take a sleep bag with a body in it, fling it around. I mean, yes, it takes a lot to, to twist somebody's head off. That's pretty cool, too. But, I mean, at the top is really just the brute force that Jason comes acro- across with. The simplicity, I guess, is what I'm looking for of taking somebody's arm and pulling it right out of the socket yeah. and just, oh, isn't it just almost <laughs> turns you on, right? <laughs> Was there like a uh, aha moment for you when you got to put the costume on for the first time? Yeah, you know, the first time, sometimes I get the question, 
what's the best scene that I like? The best scene was my first scene. You'll always remember your first scene. You know, I get this wardrobe on, we're shooting at night, and it's Jason's side profile, POV, point of view. And to my right is the, as I walk into frame, I'm looking back at the mobile home rocking. And I turn and I give that look, that quarter inch nod, curiosity factor going back to Frankenstein. That was my first scene. I'll always remember that first scene because I remember Tom saying, step into frame, you know, do a, a right 90 degree angle, push out your lats and just go forward, okay? And that was it, I went right towards it and again, never looked back. Hmm. With, uh, you know, working with Tom Matthews and some of that cast, it's it's interesting plot because they cover up the fact that it's actually Crystal Lake, so you're in this, you know, town that's trying to keep the secret almost uh, like Elm Street tries to keep Freddy a secret. They're co- they're covering you up. Um, but how was that filming in that kind of a uh, environment where you are this just methodical Jason Voorhees and you're getting more town opportunity kills than you are prior when it was all Camp Crystal Lake? Well, the, the film was actually shot under the code Aladdin Sane. That's how my script still reads that I have. So nobody knew it was Friday the 13th. That was kept tight to everybody, especially when you're on set. You know, sets were closed. They were at night. Most people were sleeping. But with that, it kept a tight reins on the fact that it was a Friday the 13th because of the fans. Um, you know, you may not know this, but theoretically there was going to be a part 13, I guess it would be now, shot uh, about a year and a half ago. And the same camp was booked out for a three month window for the shoot. Hmm. For whatever reason, the two principals couldn't come to terms that own two of the rights, so it kind of went by the way, but I understand they've started to get together with some courts that have agreed so we can get another one out. But I think if they go back to the concept, it is the same thing. Everybody tries to forget about Freddy or Jason or Frankenstein, if you think about it for a second. Go back and watch an old black and white. They don't talk about Frankenstein. It's a myth, and then all of a sudden you got another crazy doctor putting together body parts. Mm So I think it's just par for the course. You know, next generation comes through, it was a myth, didn't exist, get everybody so they're not freaked out, and then here comes your boy again. Yeah. Um, when you uh, have done it, you know, there's so many fan films, um, Never Hike Alone, and there's that little com- cameo by uh, Tom, when he, Tommy, uh, Jarvis is driving the ambulance. I don't know if you've gotten to check that out yet or not. Would you ever consider uh, maybe facing off with him in that fashion if they got the uh, funding in that way and it's just a Friday fan film, but they said, hey, man, we uh, we want Jason. Would you ever uh, portray him in that kind of a fashion? Yeah, I think, you know, here I get the question, would I play Jason again? Um, you know, we are in Sacramento, so a lot of you are aware that my past, I was general manager of Thunder Valley Resort Casino. Some of you may not know that, some of you may know that. So for the last 25 years, I've ran casino resorts. When I stepped away a year and a half ago to retire, um, I was able to start meeting the fans and play with the Friday the 13th and put some letters of intent out there for some other films. Uh, It just happens one of them is a Friday the 13th vengeance in which I've agreed to play Elias Voorhees, Jason's father. So there's some twists that'll come with that. Really popular now is the YouTube films that are coming out. For those of you that are in the social media platforms heavily, and wow, what a job these folks are doing with today's technology, with drones and go cameras and stuff. It's completely different than in my era when we did these movies because of the technology advancement and the simplicity and the talent. Hell of a lot of good talent out there. Um, but I think there's some opportunities to put some together. Some fan films, Never Hike Alone was one of them, a good example. Um, I do understand that there are other people looking right now to script a Friday the 13th. Again, I think that my understanding is uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham, uh, the two parties eventually are going to come together on the decision making of who owns what part of the right. Once they do, they can get it back out and mainstream it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe Paramount will be back involved with that point because two separate studios had rights, as did two separate individuals. And I think those terms are getting shorter. 
and the uh, right of refusal is passed where they can start working together. So I don't know if you can share with us getting the opportunity to be Elias. Is that movie, are we talking like kind of Jason origin where before he even goes to Camp Crystal Lake? Or are you Elias after Jason has already come back? I guess I can, I can give you this. Uh, the punt on the, the actual poster that says Vengeance Friday the 13th uh, is Father Knows Best. Hmm. <laughs> and when do you guys start to uh, work on that? It's in pre-production, post-production, what they called. So if you take a look, if you pulled it up, you'd find it. Uh, it's going through the process. I did an interview about a, two weeks ago with a gentleman named Jason, believe it or not, who is going to play the Jason. He's a very similar size to me and um, went through the process. And I learned a few more things about the film, the way they want to do it. But it is going to be a great opportunity to do some portrayals and actually get some involvement mm -hmm. for the fans. I think the most important thing is making money is important. I get it. It's a return on the investment, ROI. But at the end of the day, the fans are what made Friday the 13th you. And sometimes they got to get away from bickering of who owns what to keep you happy and satisfied to keep this franchise of what it's become. I always tell people, if I hold up a picture of Tom Cruise, Worldwide, hey, it's Tom Cruise. They all know him. I guarantee you hold a picture of C.J. Graham. They're not going to know exactly who he is, but if you hold a picture of a hockey mask, they'll know it's Jason. Oh yeah, for so sure. So the notoriety, uh, not being maybe an A actor, quote unquote, but at the same time, the notoriety is because of the fans worldwide, and that's because of everybody in this room. So thank you. Yeah. I got one more question before we open it up. I always enjoy asking uh, actors, actresses, filmmakers from uh, properties like Friday the 13th. Every year, my friends and I, we pilgrimage down to L.A. during this time of the year for Halloween events, Halloween Horror Nights. This year, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I've favoritism towards Halloween Horror Nights Universal, but WB, uh, you got to go, man. They did it Camp Crystal Lake. They, they built the camp. You walk up the camp trail, they filled in this landfill with water, they built the boat dock, built four cabins, and the first thing that you see through this haunt experience is backlit, fog rolling in, Jason Voorhees standing on this boat dock. Have you ever, because they've done it, Universal's done Friday houses a bunch, have you ever gone through one and seen yourself? I've seen myself. Yeah, I have. The interesting thing is, you know, going back to what you said is, you know, um, and Kane will tell you the same thing. I was booked originally for part seven through Paramount Studios. Um, John was going to be the director. Frank Mancuso Jr. was going to be the producer from Paramount. Kane Hodder is a huge horror fan. We're talking huge. And, you know, he had to go to John, who was the director, and he had worked with John. John really said, okay, you know, Kane. John had to go to Paramount to get the part for Kane. Again, from an ambassador perspective of doing the Jason, he did four of them. He's been out there every week doing shows and helping to get the franchise to where it is today. So I always say thank you to Kane because he really did a great job. And if they couldn't, would have continued to individualize the Jasons, you may not have what Kane has done for everybody to get out there. I think every time I see a Jason, you know, I'm reminded that I'm part of that franchise. Uh, it's interesting how people do not know your face until I stand up and they're like, oh yeah, he's Jason. <laughs> but it's amazing. I've gone through TSA. Everybody been through TSA, right? And had an agent look at my name and look at me and goes, are you going to play Jason? I'm like, you have to be kidding. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I go, D you know, Derek Mears? He goes, yeah. I go, see the guy back there? That's Derek. You know, we were coming from a show years ago. It's amazing. I've been to Universal Studios and been walking with my family, and somebody goes, you played Jason. And I'm thinking, <laughs> how do you know this with a hockey mask? So those are the fans that really bleed Jason. They really know who we are, and I'm appreciative. And it's a nice feeling to be recognized and appreciated. Um, but at the same time, I always go back and look at you and say thank you for what you've done for us, because the series still continues on. WB, Universal Studios, anything you see that's adjacent is because the fans have met, made it, kept it alive. No different than the Frankenstein of the horror. Remember back in the 60s and the 50s, if you go back and look at those, Mummy, 
So, I mean, everybody's got to remember where it started. It started with some hard work and then a fan base. Right on. Who has a question for CJ? In the uh, music video, Yeah, that was, I did a thing with, uh, everybody knows Alice Cooper, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, man behind the mask. Alice Cooper is, is I've met him several times, fortunate enough to uh, work with him. I'm hoping that in November, in the November 1st of December, I'm doing a show uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And they're in the process of seeing when they can work in Alice Cooper's schedule for him to come in. And I'm going to put the wardrobe on, and we're going to do photo ops with Alice Cooper and Jason. So that should be fun. Um, one thing that eventually will happen here as Sacramento continues to grow uh, with their con, and this has been an amazing con, is the photo op opportunity for you to come in and take pictures. And it's, it's developing, and I, I'm quite confident Tim and everybody will get it here eventually. But one of the big things that's out there right now is me putting on the full wardrobe and bringing you into a studio setting with a green screen and grabbing you by the throat uh, <laughs> and having photos with Jason Wardrobe. Myself, we did a, a show a while back with six of us. Kane, Ken, all the way down to Ted White, and wardrobe with fans. So it's wow. become a big deal. And even the fans that don't wear a hockey mask, you know, everyone wants to take a, a picture with them. You do your selfies, but these are fan, these are pictures that are done professionally. So you've got an eight by ten. That's really cool. Anybody else a question? Uh, the underwater scenes was that in a tank, or were you guys actually in the, mm -hmm. the lake? In so the water scenes in part six, you're gonna love this because it's different areas. You see me coming out of the water and going into the water? That's a stagnant lake in Covington, Georgia. Stagnant means it doesn't move. It's yucky. You know, it's uh, got leeches and water moccasins. True story. Uh, they forgot to tell me about that when I did the movie though. Um, I didn't learn until I got out and went to the shower and they said we need to look for leeches. Thanks a lot, you know. Jeez. But that's a stagnant lake. Then there's another scene where you see me being set on fire. One scene where I'm actually in an Olympic pool in Los Angeles. Then there's a scene underwater which I'm in a diving Olympic swimming pool in Los Angeles. 20 feet underwater, chained down, breathing off regulators, doing this, the fights. Then the water scene where the hockey mask gets wiped out and you see the blood and guts come out at the very end of the movie, that's actually Tom McLaughlin's mother and father's pool in the backyard in Los Angeles. So movie magic. So, and I always laugh because Tom had promised his parents he'd clean the pool <laughs> because they went down and got guts from a pig and all kinds of stuff to do that scene. So when that propeller hit, they went flying in the pool so I find it interesting about Tom getting mom and dad to let them come in the backyard and do that last shot. So four different areas, four different waters. Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, back there. What's, uh, what's your favorite kill from part uh, six? He's got a Michael Myers shirt on too. <laughs> Are you late to class? <laughs> okay, I already answered that question. <laughs> For those of you that didn't hear or are late to class, breaking the sheriff's back, that power just to snap it, man. I mean, that to me is the best kill because of the force, that intensity that it takes to hurt somebody like that. Right here, yeah. Go for it. So you must have interviewed with Steve Dash because Steve always talks about his little cut in his finger. Yeah, I cut my finger. Jesus, the shoes didn't fit. No, I don't have anything to complain about. I, w I was Jason. All right, I didn't feel pain. All right, I was a badass. Yeah, in the back. That, were you late to class? <laughs> so, paintball scene, I got the shirt though, I love you bro, I love you. Paintball scene was not me, but it, yes it was a real, a real paintball gun the way they did it. And there was a little padding on the guy that did it, um, and that's why there's an illusion, everybody just thinks it's me with padding. 
but it was a real paintball gun. They did a great job because of the way it splattered, as you can see. Obviously, you played the game and been hit, so you know. <laughs> Michael. Uh, I say, uh, so I grew up in Arizona, and I was going to ask you if you had any else for stories, but since we're talking about that, I did want to mention, have you heard there's a statue in Lake Pleasant of Jason chained up underwater for scuba divers? And I guess it's controversial. Some people in Arizona want to move. I, I, I understand there is a Jason chained down for scuba divers. So if you can imagine being down at the bottom of the lake and coming across this mannequin chained to the bottom might be a little fearful. I mean, it's not my choice. I mean, if that's something you did, I think it's artistic. I think it's original. You know, um, I wasn't aware of the location. I've heard of it multiple times. But I think it'd be kind of cool if you're out there and you get pictures and somebody goes, I mean, could you imagine if you were in a scuba tank, you come around the corner and there's Jason? <laughs> Think about it. Mm -hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> okay, if you were directing the movie, what kill would you add? What kill would I add? I think I'd add a different point of view, because we talked about earlier with today's technology and body cams, you really can get it, can you imagine doing something with your hands where it, it's close, it's just connected to your arm now because they do things like that. So I think the only thing I have not seen Jason do, this is my, and maybe I've seen it because it's stuck in my mind, I've never seen Jason go into somebody's face, into their brains and pull their brains out. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Right through the eyeballs, and just pull it out. I've never seen that now, maybe I've seen it somewhere all right, in a movie, but I've never seen Jason do that. I think that would be an amazing kill because of the force that it would take to go through somebody's skull with your fist. It's actually kind of surprising he hasn't. Yeah, I don't, he hasn't. So, I, I mean, I think there's so many cool generic kills out there that could be incorporated in today's Jason Factor. Um, if I was doing, and again, it's easy to be an armchair quarterback, you know. I ain't putting up the $15 million to make the movie. And I'm just the outsider looking in, armchair quarterback. That's for all you guys that got something to say tomorrow when you didn't like the play. Oh, you should have done this. Like hell, you wouldn't have done the same thing, all right? <laughs> Point is, I think it would be cool that if you had Jason come back in today's element with the way camera technology has developed, radio frequencies and stuff, that they could do something really ironic without using too much technology, green screens, computer systems, the reality of it. But I also think it'd be fun to bring all the Jasons that are still living, which all of them are except Richard, and they would have cameos in it without wardrobe. So you can imagine me being the sheriff coming in and the new Jason kills me. So everybody would be coming to see the Jasons that have played in reality be whacked by who the new champ is and let that go forward because it's got a twist to it. You're still going to have camp counselors, you're going to have mechanics, you're going to have sheriffs, everybody's going to get killed, but why not use the Jasons to put a sick twist to it? Because everybody's going to want to see who they are, you yeah. know, and watch each one of them get whacked. Mm -hmm. And each one of them gets whacked by their favorite kill. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Kane gets in a sleeping bag, dead. <laughs> we have time for one more, go ahead. Did you have one? It's not very good. Well. Did you ever play the Friday the 13th Nintendo game? The Whatever. Nintendo game? Yeah. Well, you're going back a ways, all right? No, I, I, I'm very familiar with it. And that's one thing that's really brought to the forefront. Kane Hodder did a lot of work on the recent video game that's come out. And that's been a big factor for a lot of the younger fans to come forward and participate and get into the Jason era, the genre because they've been out there playing that different game. So Kane did a great job of representing all of us and trying to mimic our movement to put into that. Um, the Nintendo one, no, I never did that. So, I mean, that's going back a couple years. Um, <laughs> but I think for those of you who have played it and are playing it, it's very popular, you know, and again, it's just part of the feature of the iconic image. Everybody, please help me in thanking Mr. C.J. Graham for coming. You can visit him at his table. He's got some really cool masks and machetes and machetes. Real machetes. So, <laughs> but I strap them because I know some of you're gonna get a little crazy. <laughs> but yeah, go by his table. See him this weekend. 
And uh, yeah, one more time. Thank you guys.